Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Goedemorgen. Um, welcome to the third public weekend of the four-week caucus. So we are now um, on halfway through, I think, in some ways, maybe a bit over halfway through, um, uh, looking at uh, this whole question of becoming Dutch through um, the minds, the thoughts, the intelligences of a whole series of people, thinkers, writers, uh, artists. Um, and I suppose halfway through, it might be useful to um, not necessarily look back at, uh, for a moment, because that would be too long, <laughs> but um, certainly to think about where we are and also what process we're involved in. Um, I know some of you have come to the caucus for the first time this morning. Uh, many of you have, been, have listened to me uh, uh, define and talk about the caucus previously, so please forgive me if I repeat myself sometimes. Um, but the caucus uh, is taken from uh, different sources, but mainly from a, a Native American term, uh, meaning the idea of coming together, collecting together in order to make a decision. Um, we've run a number of caucuses in, in the past. Danny and I have been involved in one in, in Cork, and there have also been previous uh, sort of prototypes of caucus in Jogjakarta and in Seoul. Uh, so we've built up some sort of experience uh, in the caucus and what the caucus might possibly produce. Is this on? Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I can't hear myself, that's the problem. Um, so in, in this sense, we've, uh, we've tried to um, develop um, a methodology um, for thinking about how we can collectively make a decision. But I have to say, in the last two weeks, some things have become clearer to us um, than they have been in the past. And it might be worthwhile me sharing some of those thoughts before we start on this, uh, on this third weekend. It seems to me that um, what we're engaged in here, as much as coming together to make a decision, is also a public research moment. Um, research is normally done in private. And I'm conscious of a lot of the speakers, including the speakers here today, were people who we would have read, perhaps we would have contacted by email, in our development of an exhibition called Becoming Dutch. But what we've tried to do is to open that process so that you as a public can see in, in, in mathematics, you often say the idea of seeing your, showing your working. In a sense, it's about showing your working in public um, in order not only to say this is what our working is, but also to get you to correct it. <laughs> Actually, the principle is that we set up a dialogue in which our thoughts are then mediated through the conversation that happens over these four weeks. And not only mediated, totally transformed. And that is certainly, as far as Annie and I are concerned, is, has been and will happen in this process. In other words, what might be said to be the outcome of the caucus, which will be this exhibition in May 2008, is profoundly being affected in the here and now of this public research moment. So it seems in a sense we were turning something from private to public, from what is traditionally seen to be a necessary private exercise into a provisionally public exercise, learning how to become public as much as we're learning how to become Dutch. Now, this made me reflect a little bit on the idea of the condition of the collection. I was actually talking to our speaker this morning, Boris Groys, um, last night briefly about it. The question that the, the museum collection is based entirely around objects, generally mute objects. Some of them talk because they have an audio component, but basically they are objects. Um, and I've been fascinated by this idea that, that in, in the, the, the hyper market, you could say, of, uh, of, the, of the art market of today, in the hyper capitalism that we exist in, um, where products are all and our values invested in products uh, continuously. Um, we are simply reproducing the um, basic acquisitional uh, constructs of capitalism in our collections. And I thought to, to try and define, or think at least, about the idea of, of not collecting objects anymore, or at least reducing the reliance on the object, this mute object, as the way in which the collection might be defined. A Picasso hanging on a wall, that's what you own. So there's everything around that is not what you own, it's a condition, it's a context, it's a presentation. What you own is this object. Um, and I've been trying to find ways of describing this, and I think Caucasus has, has somehow um, at least given, us, given me, or me or us as a museum some pointers towards what this might be. Because I've been using this term, let us try and collect relations, rather than let us collect objects, as a term which could lead, at least fire the imagination, to think about what the collection might be. 
And it seems to me that in Caucasus we're beginning that process of collecting relations. And their relations not only with the people who we might have had relations with anyway, because we'd have been in touch with them on email or we'd have been reading them, but they're also an attempt to build up a relationship with Eindhoven and with the people who are here and with the international group of, of uh, participants who are taking a part in the whole caucus over the four weeks. So it seems to me that the, 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 the challenge, in a sense, is to see what will be left over of that collection of relationships, not only in the exhibition itself, but also in the ongoing dialogues, and how we can transform the momentum of the museum, not to make this a one-off, singular moment where we open ourselves from private research to public research, but how that can then be reflected in our very existence, in the core of the institution. And this becomes a, um, a, a fascinating, also perhaps a worrying possibility, uh, in terms of what this institution is. If we are about collecting relations, and if we are about developing the idea of the relationship, the human relationship, but also the relationship between objects and humans. These, these various kinds of relationships that can happen. If we are about that, then we need to really think about our policy in quite, in quite profound ways and need to analyze it again. And I think in that, and this is a long-term project, this is not going to be solved in May 2008, I'm not sure it will be solved in May 2058, but nevertheless, the move from one to the other. So I think something that's required of public institutions like us, when we compare ourselves with the idea of the private collector, when we can can compare ourselves with the idea of the art market and the free market in wider terms. There were a, a, a couple of, of, of comments, I think, that are, that, that are particularly important from Hamid Baba's talk to, to, to remember or to, to reflect on for a moment in relationship to this, because sometimes this seems like a kind of quite glib description of a movement from objects to relations, quite a glib move, quite a, quite a, quite a smooth transition from private to public. And of course it's not, it's very rough, and it's very uncertain, and it's very jerky, and it doesn't work. But actually that process, it seems to me, is closer to the idea of he uh, that, that, uh, that, that, that Hami Baba introduced of, of ambivalence, of living within the tensions, of living within the paradoxes, than it is in a sort of glib description of where we are going to go and some kind of Leninist look into the future. It actually offers that global ambivalence offers a, a, a panacea for the danger of getting carried away by a particular policy, but also that ambivalence states our position, I think, more clearly and, and understands where we are in quite an interesting way. And I was also thinking about this question of relations and collecting relations in terms of Hami Baba's idea of, of the description that he made, I should maybe repeat it, when he was talking about a, um, a Hutu who had murdered a Tutsi neighbor. And he said that uh, the, the, the Tutsi neighbor, at the, at the moment of the fatal blow, when he killed him, seemed to the Hutu to be neither strange nor close. And what he said was that is exactly this strange and close is what a relationship between neighbors is. And this strange and close is, in a sense, what we have to think about collecting. The strange and closeness that we might represent to each other but we also, as an institution, might represent in the city, being strange and close in Eindhoven. And it seems that strange and close offers all sorts of understandings of the role of an institution. Not to fit in, not to be familiar, not to provide what's needed, but also to be close, also to be annoying in that way that neighbors who are playing their music too loud are annoying. <laughs> but you have to deal with it. So that's strange and close seems to be important, in, 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 at least in, in thinking in terms of relations and how we might conjure them. And the final point I want to make um, is that we've often talked, uh, again, I think quite glibly sometimes, about the idea of the outcome of this whole process being an exhibition in May 2008, and hopefully a lot of other uh, outcomes as well, but this has been a kind of focus, and of course it should remain a focus. It's a pragmatic decision to do this. But also what became clear, I think, from Shep Steiner's talk, which I, has taken a long time to filter down, um, this idea of, of close reading, that actually the outcome of that, the outcome of this, will be in the artworks that are shown in that exhibition. And the artists who participate, some of whom participate in this, some of whom participate in part of it, some of whom are talking, the, 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 the information that they might take away and process in their own terms, in their own close readings of this event, and then subsequently in our public close readings of the exhibition itself. 
In other words, that there is not a collective moment of decision and the exhibition does not represent some kind of consensual agreement that this is what becoming Dutch is going to be, or this is what becoming Dutch might mean, or these are the problems about becoming Dutch. It will be in that close reading of particular artworks that what we talk about as the, as the product of the caucus can be read and can be reread by the public. So the last two weeks have, have kind of been enormously encouraging, enormously confusing at times, as you can probably hear from my kind of thinking through this process that we're going through, but also enormously um, uh, inspiring of, of, uh, of new possibilities for this institution itself, at least in the local terms of, of, of the Van Abbe Museum. Um, so um, I would like to actually thank all of you for all of that construction, uh, constructive criticism, and all of that input, which has changed a lot of our thoughts in terms of how we are developing today. Now, we have a, it's an enormous privilege for me to, to have the opportunity to introduce um, Boris Groys. He's somebody who I've always wanted to bring here. We've tried a few times before and never quite succeeded, but the caucus and the momentum of the caucus managed to drag him away from Germany to come here finally. Um, uh, Boris is, is the professor at the School of Design and the ZKM, the, the Center for Art and Media in Karlsruhe in Germany. Uh, also, uh, he was the um, curator of a, a long-term project called Post-Communist Condition, uh, which consisted of um, symposia, exhibitions, and a wonderful publication, which was put together over the last few years. It's now finished. Um, and he's also um, going to have a, a series of his essays collected and published by M MIT Press at the beginning of next year, the beginning of 2008. I recommend all of you to go and buy it. Uh, the collection of essays is called Art Power. Um, Boris's talk today will touch on one of the paradoxes, one of the themes that we've been thinking about, which is the question of religion and the question of faith. Uh, and his talk today is called Religion as Medium. Boris, please, thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. Uh, my talk today is also connected uh, to a certain project that I, I now uh, will try to realize uh, at the ZKM in Karlsruhe. Uh, that is an exhibition under this title, uh, The Medium Religion, or Religion as a Medium. And uh, the text I uh, would like to present to you today is a kind of uh, preparatory, or I don't know, is a kind of introduction to this, uh, to this exhibition. Uh, so uh, it's a part of an ongoing process on, uh, of reflection uh, on what's happening in the field of an interconnection between new religious movements and contemporary media, and how it affects uh, image production uh, and reception in our time. Um, so I didn't do this uh, exhibition yet. It is planned uh, for the next year. I don't, I don't know what I will be thinking about that uh, after, after this exhibition takes place. Uh, but now, this kind of introduction, and to a certain degree, also, uh, program uh, for this uh, for this undertaking. Well, religion is often understood as a certain set of opinions. There, religion is associated with opinions about whether cons uh, contraception uh, should be permitted or women should wear headscarves. Correspondingly, religion is usually discussed in the context of a demand for a freedom of opinion guaranteed by law. As a set of opinions, religion is tolerated as long as it is, remains tolerant and does not question the freedom of other opinions, that is to say, as long as it makes no exclusive fundamentalist claim to its own truth. But I would suggest that religion, any religion, is primarily not a set of opinions, but a set of rituals. And the religious, religious ritual refers rather to a state of lack of opinion, state of opinionlessness, adoxia. For it refers to the will of the gods 
or of God that is ultimately hidden to the opinions of mortals. The ritual as such is neither true nor false. In the sense, it marks zero level of freedom of opinion, actually the freedom from every kind of opinion, from the obligation to have an opinion. A religious ritual can be repeated or abandoned or modified, but it cannot be legitimized, criticized, or refuted. Accordingly, the fundamentalist is not somebody who insists on a certain set of opinions, but rather somebody who wants certain rituals to be not abandoned or modified by faithfully, correctly reproduced. The true fundamentalist cares not about, doesn't care about fidelity to the truth, but about the correct repetition, reproduction of the ritual, not about the theoretical or rather theological interpretations of faith, but about the material form of religion. Every religion is based on repetition, on reproduction. But we traditionally tend to distinguish between two kinds of repetition. Firstly, repetition in spirit. That means repetition of the true inner essence of a religious message. We are speaking about belief and faith in this, in this context. And secondly, repetition of the external form of religion, external form of religious ritual. The opposition between these two types of repetition, between living spirit and dead letter, informs the whole Western discourse on religion. The first kind of repetition is almost always regarded as true repetition, as authentic inner continuation of a certain religious tradition, a continuation that at the same time presupposes a possibility of a rupture with a merely external, conventional, historical, accidental form of this tradition, or even requires such a rupture. It's a kind of romantic yeah, notion, subjective notion of religion. A religious tradition that is capable to, to transform itself and to adapt to the changing circumstances without losing its inner essential spiritual identity is usually praised as a living, powerful tradition that maintains its vitality and historical relevance. On the contrary, the superficial fidelity to the mere letter, to the empty ritual, is as a rule regarded as a symptom of a lack of vitality and even as a betrayal of the inner religious truth through a purely mechanical reproduction of its external dead form. Now, the fundamentalism is precisely this, the insistence on the letter against the spirit. That is why the religious fundamentalism has always a revolutionary dimension. It breaks with the politics of spirit, that is, with the politics of reform, flexibility, adaptation to the zeitgeist, and substitute it by the violent politics of letter. Now, if we look at the religious movements that are especially active in our days, we immediately see that they are mostly fundamentalist movements, and it is, of course, not accidental. The contemporary religious fundamentalism can be seen as the most radical product of the European Enlightenment and the materialist view of the world. The religious fundamentalism is a religion after the death of spirit, after the loss of spirituality, after the death of God, we can say. As we know, the Enlightenment killed God, killed the spirit. But if the spirit dies, it is a letter that remains. The religious fundamentalism is the only possible form of religion after enlightenment and after the victory of materialism, because the religion is now only a letter, uh, have only a letter ritual at its disposal. And the religious repetition can only be a repetition of the letter of the ritual. Or put it another way, a difference in the material form of religion cannot be compensated anymore by identity in spirit. A material difference is now just a difference. You see what you see. There is no essence, no being, no meaning underlying such a form of difference on a deeper level. 
If you see a difference on the surface, you may not look any deeper for a hidden inner identity behind the surface, because such an identity can be only an imaginary one. In the sense, the fundamental religion movements are also religions after the deconstruction, as post-deridian uh, religions. If meaning, sense, and intention cannot be stabilized, the only possibility of authentic repetition is a literal repetition, beyond any meaning, sense, and intention. In his book, Difference and Repetition, Gilles Deleuze speaks of literal repetition as being radically artificial and in the sense as being in conflict with everything natural, living, changing, developing, including, as he says, natural law and also moral law, because moral uh, principles also moving in time and changing in time and history. To practice literal repetition can be seen, therefore, as initiating a rupture in the continuity of life. Uh, Walter Benjamin also speaks in his remarks uh, on the philosophy of history about the revolution, now socialist revolution, as a break with the continuity of historical evolution, of historical progress, by the means of a literal repetition of the past in his remarks uh, on history. And he speaks also about the capitalism as a new kind of religion that is only a ritual, devoid of any theology and spirituality. Actually, this idea of a revolution as fundamental repetition, you can see it everywhere else in socialist movements, but for example, Lacan and his repetition of Freud as a revolution against some kind of adaptation of frontal teaching to the actual um, economic and political conditions. But the literal repetition is not only a revolution or a clue to the revolution, not only an act of violence against the flow of historical change, the literal repetition can be seen also as a way to personal self-sacralization and immortality. Immortality of the subject that is ready to submit itself to such a repetition. Not accidentally, the working class that performs the repetitive, alienated, one can say, ritual work in the context of the modern industrial civilization was in a certain sense sacralized by the socialist movements of the 19th and 20th century. Various and intellectual and as artists, as embodiments of the creative spirit of change, remain profane precisely, uh, profane precisely because of their incapacity, uh, incapacity and capability to repeat and reproduce. Actually, to be creative is to fall out of sacrality, of sacral time and sacral space. It's to become profane. Already Nietzsche proclaimed the literal repetition, eternal return of the same, on the level of the world of appearances, to be the only chance to think immortality after the death of spirit, after the death of God. One can say that the religious ritual is a ur form of the mechanical reproduction that dominates our contemporary world, especially our contemporary media. That is why the fundamentalist religious movements became so successful in our time. They demonstrate the exchangeability between religious ritual and mechanical reproduction. So what I'm interested in speaking about religion is at the moment at least, it's not faith or belief. It's not kind of subjective attitude towards certain religious uh, truths. But one can say, a religion as a technology, as a certain kind of technique, which is a technique of literal reproduction of certain action, of certain ritual in time. And to a certain degree, this initial act of reproduction lies at the heart of contemporary technique, technology, technological world as such. So the standard diagnosis of today's civilization is that over the course of modern age, Theology was replaced by philosophy, an orientation towards the past by an orientation towards the future, tradition by subjective evidence, fidelity to origins by innovation 
and so on. In fact, however, the modern age was not the age in which the sacred was abolished, but the age in, uh, of its dissemination in profane space, its democratization and its globalization. Once ritual repetition and reproduction were practiced in isolated sacred places, in the modern age, ritual repetition and reproduction have become the fate of the entire world, the entire culture. Even the progress is ultimately reproductive. It consists in constantly repeated destruction of everything that cannot be reproduced quickly and effectively. Yeah, that's what is progress, actually. One can say that just that Kazimir Malevich Black Square reveals the medium painting because it causes all figuration of disappear. Black Square is fundamentalist per se. Yeah? It goes to the fundamental truth of any possible image and repeats this fundamental truth in a potentially eternal manner, that today's fundamentalist religious movements can be understood as an avant-garde on our present world because they reveal the pure mediality of the contemporary media of reproduction. Later, I will show you fragments taken from two different videos that I would like to use to illustrate this point. But before I will show these videos, I would like to say a couple of words about the medium video in general. And specifically, why this medium is especially relevant for the discussion of the contemporary religious fundamentalism. First of all, uh, from purely sociological point of view, video is a chosen medium of contemporary religious propaganda, which is distributed through different channels of TV, internet, commercial video stores, etc. That is especially true of the most recent and most active, even aggressive, religious movements. Bin Laden, to refer to this well-known name, communicates uh, with the outside world primarily by the medium video. In fact, we know him as a video artist in the first place. <laughs> we are very much acquainted, meanwhile, with the phenomenon of the confession videos of the suicide bombers and many other kinds of video production reflecting the mentality of the radical Islam. But on the other hand, the new evangelical movements also operate by the same medium of video. If you ask the people, and I did it, um, who are responsible for the public relations of the different uh, fundamental evangelical movements, um, to help you with some information, you get videos sent to you in the first place. And there's a great amount uh, of this video production, uh, incredible scale. The same is true for many other recent sects, Christian and non-Christian. The same medium is also operative in the kind of psychological warfare that reflects the contemporary interreligious tension. Good example are, of course, example of videos from Abu Ghraib prison. This use by different religious movements of the video as a major medium of self-presentation and of attack of the other is a relatively new phenomenon. The standard traditional media uh, were rather a script, a book, a painted image maybe, or a sculpture. Now I would like to suggest that the use of video as a leading medium by the contemporary religious movements is not something external to the message of these movements. And it is also not external to the understanding of the religious as such that is underlying this use. Uh, it doesn't mean that, as McLuhan would say, the medium is here the message. Rather, that I would like to suggest that the message became here the medium. A certain religious message became the digital code. To illustrate this series, I would like to reflect on two different but deeply interconnected aspects of video as a medium. Firstly, of the video being a prominent example of digital reproduction. And secondly, of the video being a moving image in contrast to the traditional images like painting or sculpture, but also book. And I would suggest that this both technical characteristic of the video are very much consistent with the practice of the contemporary fundamentalist religious movements. The digital images have the ability to originate, to multiply, and to distribute themselves 
So the open field of the contemporary means of communication, such as internet or cell phone networks, spontaneously and anonymously, without any centralized control. So we have the uh, kind of feeling that they're coming to us from above without any specific author. Yeah? We, just, we just are in a world where certain videos and also digitalized images circulate. And we don't know what is the origin, actually, uh, of these um, uh, images. Uh, even the secret services or whatever uh, cannot uh, trace, uh, in many cases, uh, this origin. So there are images without origin, and in this sense, divine images, yeah, uh, by definition. At the same time, the digitalization guarantees a literal reproduction of an image more effectively than every other known technique. But of course, it is not so much the digital image itself than the image file, the digital data that remains identical to the process of its reproduction and distribution. And the image file is not a Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Good. It's working again? Yeah. Okay. So. You have to repeat. I do. <laughs> I do. At the same time, the digitalization guarantees a literal reproduction of an image more effectively than every other known technique, apparently. Because, of course, it is not so much the digital image itself than the image file, the digital data that remains identical to the process of its reproduction and distribution. And the image file is not an image. The image file, so digital code as such, is actually invisible. The digital image is an effect of the visualization of the invisible image file of the invisible digital data. Only the heroes of the movie Matrix could see the image files, the digital code as such. We don't do that. You need a red pill, I believe. <laughs> so the average spectator has not a magic pill that would allow him or her, like the heroes of Matrix, to enter the space of invisibility behind the digital image to be confronted directly with the digital data itself. And such a spectator has not the technique that would allow him to transfer the data directly into the brain and to experience it in the mode of pure, non-visualizable suffering, like another movie, Johnny Mnemonic. I hope you know the movie. The guy has all these files, or a lot of files in his brain, you can see them, yeah? But you can feel them as suffer, yeah? Because his um, uh, wonderful image, because his brain is overloaded. Uh, and pure suffering is, as we know, the most adequate experience of the invisible. So uh, uh, actually, um, genuine religious experience. So the digital data should be visualized, should become an image to be seen, should be performed. And performant in some repetitive, ritual way to become visible. The act of the visualization of the invisible digital data is thus analogous to the appearance of the invisible inside the topography of the visible world. Biblically speaking, signs and wonders. Uh, that originates the religious rituals. In this respect, the digital image is functioning like a Byzantine icon a visible copy of invisible gold. Yeah, so if you look at the computer screen, it's like a Byzantine icon. The digital data substitutes here as the invisible god of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. In his famous essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, Walter Benjamin asserts that the artwork, also a ritual object and ritual as such, loses its aura when it is transported from the original place to another space on when it is copied. So it seems 
that the loss of aura is especially significant in the case of visualization of the image file. If a traditional analog original is moved from one place to another, it remains a part of the same space, of the same topography, uh, of the same visible world. On the contrary, the digital original, the digital data, is moved by its visualization from the space of invisibility, from the status of non-image, to the space of visibility, to the status of image. And it is, of course, the act of especially acute loss of aura. But what is a loss of aura? This profanation has a character of sacral ritual because every ritual, originally what it is, it is a depiction of repetition of the act of bringing of the sacral in the world. It is interesting that actually sacral rituals are repeating the act of profanation, the act of profanation of God coming into the world. Yeah? So we have a very interesting interplay from the beginning between sacral and profane. In fact, Benjamin ignores this ambivalence. He thinks traditionally enough, he describes the religious experience as, let's say, spiritual experience, romantic experience. In this respect, it is very characteristic how he evokes an experience of being enchanted by an Italian landscape as an example of, of an oratic experience. It is experience of happiness, of fullness of life, intensity of life. But one can argue that the true religious experience is actually the experience of death rather than experience of life, the experience of death in the middle of life. So precisely because a mechanical reproduction can be understood as a lifeless repetition of the dead image, it can be also interpreted as a source of the truly religious experience. So one can say, like a, like a death of Christ on the cross, yeah? one can say that it's precisely the loss of aura that is the most radical religious experience under the conditions of modernity, because in this way a human being discovers a mechanical, machine-like, repetitive and reproductive, one can say, dead aspect of his or her own existence. Now I would like to show you a couple of videos and illustrate excerpts uh, from a couple of videos to illustrate uh, certain points that I made. Both of them uh, are about the repetition, and both of them are uh, connected to some kind of, I would say, Middle East setting, but in a very uh, different way. One of its, uh, one of these videos is a um, uh, documentary footage of the activities of the rituals of the so-called Visarion sect. It is a post-communist uh, Russian sect that emerged after the downfall of the Soviet Union under the title Church of the Last Testament. So Visarion, who is a prophet uh, of the sect, uh, it, uh, its membership is about two millions, in fact, so it's not big, but it's also not small. So the center of the sect, and uh, Visarion himself, uh, is living in Minusinsk. It's not very far from Krasnoyarsk, it's the north of Siberia, and it's not very far from the coldest place on this earth, uh, so-called Pole of the Coldness. Um, uh, with uh, temperatures in winter like 50 to uh, 60 minus centigrade. Yeah? So it's really cold. Yeah? <laughs> and uh, it's information that maybe it's important, uh, like an like a introduction to this video. You will immediately see why. And um, so, uh, you see some images of, uh, of this ritual taking place in Minosinsk. Uh, please, uh, can you show the video? Еще 
раз дружней. Любовь, любовь, нежным крылом сердца детей. Соедини, земля, земля, светлый наш дом сияет лучами нашей любви, сияет лучами нашей Here you see the Visarion, yeah, the prophet himself. And uh, what's interesting about these uh, images is that the whole thing uh, looks very Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean yeah, it's like like kind of Middle East, yeah. So it's interesting why because um, he never was uh, in Mediterranean region. He never went out of Minusinsk, in fact. And uh, nobody who is around him uh, ever traveled to Middle East yeah, in any form. So the question is, uh, where, um, where this uh, ritual uh, is coming from? So he actually uh, saw only uh, a movie, and that's a movie by Franco Zeffirelli, uh, Christ from Nazareth. Yeah? And he actually... Yeah, he act, uh, it's, it's, it's only his uh, acquaintance yeah, with, uh, with uh, Christian religious tradition. And he was so enchanted by this movie that he invented his own ritual based on this movie. And all the classes and all the design of this sect is actually Franco de Ferrelli's uh, movie transposed into the, real, into the real setting of the coldest um, region in the world. Now you see him going through the yeah, going through the crowd, and now you see the cameraman, who actually looks a very, a very Middle East. Yeah, you see, <laughs> extremely Middle East. It's it's taken of course from the Arafat, yeah, Arafat, and this Palestinian, uh, Palestinian chronics, yeah, that are shown time and again uh, on the Russian TV. Uh, so he looks authentic Palestinian, authentic Middle East. At the same time, his cameraman uh, actually showing the Christ because Visarion understands himself not as a Christian, but as true Christ. So new inter uh, um, incarnation of Christ. That reminds me uh, of the remark uh, of Nietzsche uh, from his uh, famous book, Antichrist, where he is saying that it is very sad that um, in the time as Christ lived, there was no uh, Russian novelist uh, around him uh, who could write a good novel about him. Yeah? Of course, he, uh, he thought of Dostoevsky and the psychological novel, a Russian psychological novel, in a sense of uh, Dostoevsky, was a, in terms of media politics, was the last cry yeah, at that time. I think now Nietzsche would say uh, how sad that there was no cameraman at that time. Uh, and so we can say that this uh, scene is a kind of answer uh, to this sadness of Nietzsche. Yeah? This scene compensates this lack of original documentation. This kind of idea of original documentation of the first appearance of Christ, something that we can also uh, see in the famous movie Passion by Mel Gibson, which is made in Aramaic. 
so that uh, you have to get an uh, impression that it is, was uh, made in some Aramaic studio, yeah? a kind of virtual Aramaic studio that was uh, created at the same time yeah? as, as, uh, as uh, Christ acted. Um, this idea of synchronizing the documentation with the original event, it's actually not, uh, not very new. Uh, it was formulated for the first time uh, in my memory, literary memory at least, uh, by Søren Kierkegaard in his um, reflection on who is a Christian, who can be named Christian. And he says that somebody who does believe in Christ after Christ is dead and resurrected uh, is not a Christian because he didn't experience the, additional, uh, the original doubt. The original doubt, and he says uh, that Christ, the figure of Christ, is like any other figure uh, of wandering prophet uh, at that time in Palestine, and Palestine at that time was full of wandering prophets of any kind. So to decide that uh, this guy is son of God and not that guy yeah, was a kind of fateful uh, decision. And this fateful decision, uh, we, can, we should uh, imagine the situation of being present at the moment itself and ask ourselves how we react to be able to say, are we Christian or not? This idea of a repetition that is taking us back to the origin and at the same time further away as a kind of prophecy. So a repetition that creates the original and at the same time creates the future of itself, that is a very modern idea. And uh, it's precisely what you see here. It's a chain of repetition, uh, and a repetition within the repetition. So the cameraman that is within the scene, that is itself in quotation, and so on and so on. And this kind of repetition creates a chain which em englobes the beginning, so the origin, and uh, goes toward a potentially unlimited future. Now I would, present, would like to present you a quite different, uh, at least on the surface, a quite different example of the video. It's a kind of reflective, investigative, and analytical video about the uh, suicide uh, bombings videos made by Rabi Mrua, uh, a Lebanese, uh, very good actually, Lebanese artist. Uh, the video is in, uh, absolutely brilliant, but I, uh, I can show only a, a part of it here, of course. So please, next part. I hope the sticking <laughs> will work. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm happy to be with you here in this room and I would like to thank you for attending this session. Three Posters is a video performance conceived and performed by Elias Khoury and Rabi Amroui, me, and first performed at the Ailur Festival in Beirut in September 2000. Subsequently, it has been performed in several festivals in Europe. The Tape. In 1985, Jamal Sati, a Lebanese communist, recorded a videotape testimony just a few hours before carrying out a suicide operation against the Israeli army which was occupying southern Lebanon at the time. He wore the clothes of a local sheikh and led a donkey loaded with 400 kilograms of TNT up to the headquarters of the Israeli military governor in Hasbaya. 
After passing three barricades, he reached his target, detonated the TNT, and exploded himself and the donkey along with it. Videotaping resistance fighters testifying before executing their suicide missions was a common event of the time. The videotapes were broadcast on television on the evening news. And the final cut of Jamal Assata's videotape was first seen on Tele Liban. And after 14 years, and by pure chance, a friend of ours fell upon the uncut rushes of his testimony. She found it neglected, resting on a shelf in the offices belonging to the Lebanese Communist Party. In the tape, Jamal Sater repeats his testimony three times before the camera, before deciding on the best version to be presented to the public. The difference between the three is minimal, even unimportant. The public was supposed to see only one of these versions, an uncontestable and an unequivocal presentation. Up until then, all we had ever seen on television were the final cuts, clear statements made without any hesitations, errors or stuttering. This video revealed the moment of hesitation. The instant we saw the stuttering of the martyr, we realized something simple, so simple that it, it was obvious that the martyr is not a hero but a human being. It seems to me that people in my country have forgotten this or that they don't want to be reminded of this anymore. There are very different uh, images from very different videos, but they are connected by some points that are, it's, yeah, sorry connected by some points that were interested for me as I saw them. Uh, first of all, both of them are post-communist. Uh, one uh, made in Russia after the downfall of communism. The other one is a reflection of the communist past of the suicide operations in Lebanon that was erased uh, by time and Arab Emirate uh, tries to reconstruct this erased communist past. And it's so interesting for me indeed to see this uh, video where the suicide bomber is shown uh, beside a portrait of Lenin made by uh, Brodsky that I saw in all my uh, books, uh, children books here, yeah, uh, as a school. Yeah. It's a very famous drawing. Now, uh, what's interesting, but what's central for me uh, in this respect, is this literal repetition Rabbi Mro speaking about, of these three videos. So why he made three videos instead of one video without any, any uh, visible change? One can see that as a kind of uncertainty, as uh, Rabbi Mro uh, tells us now, but he develops that later in a, in a somewhat different direction that uh, seems to me more promising and interesting in the context of what I am, uh, uh, unfortunately, it's a long uh, period that I can't see it. But I can summarize it. The idea is that this repetition in itself is an image of death already. Yeah, because he is speaking about himself, I mean the suicide bomber, so to say, from the grave. He imagines a situation that this uh, video will be shown after and will be only shown in a case of his death. Yeah? So he, his uh, goal is to produce his voice coming not from the, from the living body, but from the situation of out of grave. 
and why by doing so he starts to repeat. He starts to repeat and he makes three repetition, which is in, in, in itself kind of, of course, magical, a uh, magical number. I think, and maybe I make a next step, I think that the repetition itself is already an act that erases the life, as erases life, as already said. You know that it was an uh, interesting theory of uh, uh, Russian formalist theoretician Roman Jakobson uh, about the origin of nonsense. So how it is possible that the language becomes to be nonsensical, that incapable to transmit any meaning. That was, of course, an interesting question at that time as he was analyzing the, uh, the new kind of non-verbal, non, uh, uh, let, let's say, poetry, avant-garde and modernist poetry beyond meaning. Yeah? That, that was the topic of his writing in the 20s. And he says, through repetition, and he said that if, if we repeat the same sentence, or if we repeat the same poem, even if it is meaningful, long time enough, then the meaning psychologically is erased. In fact, uh, it is uh, confirmed by uh, the brain uh, science, so to say, that if you repeat the same text, for a very long time, the brain ceases to react to it yeah, in a meaningful way. So we don't grasp the meaning up certain point in time. So we have some kind of pure repetition goes uh, beyond uh, the horizon of our subjective experience of the sense of what is repeated. I would, I would step at that. Uh, stop at that point and make another suggestion, and then at the end of my presentation, which is not very far from now, I come uh, to this point again. Well, I said that video is a certain medium of uh, a certain kind of reproduction, which is digital one, but also a medium of motion. So uh, being a medium of motion, it is like a medium, uh, it's like a film in general. Now, if you look at a film and film history, then we see that film is eager to display superiority over other media from, from the beginning, from its emergence at the end of 19th century, beginning of the uh, 20th century. Whose greatest accomplishments are preserved in the form of immobile cultural treasures and monuments by staging and celebrating the destruction of these monuments. At the same time, this tendency also demonstrates film adherence to the typically modern phase in the superiority of vita activa over vita contemplativa. Every kind of iconophilia is ultimately rooted in a fundamentally contemplative approach and in a general readiness to treat certain objects deemed sacred exclusively as objects of distant admiring contemplation. This disposition is based on the taboo that protects these objects from being touched, from being intimately penetrated, and more generally from the profanity of being integrated into the practices of daily life. In film, nothing is deemed so holy in this sense, yeah, that it might or ought to be safeguarded from being absorbed in the general flow of movement. Everything film shows is translated into movement and thereby profaned. In this respect, film manifests its complicity with the philosophies of praxis, Lebensdrang, Elan Vital, and desire. It parades its collusion with ideas that in the footsteps of Marx and Nietzsche mesmerize the imagination of European humanity at the end of 19th and beginnings of 20th centuries. In other words, during the very period that gave birth to film as a medium. This was the era when the hitherto prevailing attitude of passive contemplation, capable of shaping ideas rather than reality, 
was displaced by adulation of the potent movements of material forces. In this act of worship, film plays a central role. From its very inception, film has celebrated everything that moves at high speed, trains, cars, airplanes, but also everything that goes beneath the surface, blades, bombs, and bullets. And of course, if, if you look at the iconography of the film production of the 20th century, the strongest images of film uh, are, the, are the images of destruction, yeah, of course. Uh, downfall of big, uh, uh, of big buildings, uh, fire in an opera, destruction of an uh, art gallery, destruction of Paris, destruction of New York, and so on. This image is something, of course, 9-11, yeah, if you look at. So iconography of our imagination, filmic imagination, is an iconography of immovable things involved into the movement, in the filmic movement, in any case, leading to the destruction of these objects. So on both sides, uh, of the specificity of these mediums, we can really interpret the new religious movements as they try to make it from the beginning as kind of a rearrangement or a resituation of religion in a materialist and practical civilization of time. So it's not about contemplation. It's not about faith and belief. It's not about staying in front of the sacred. It's about doing something. It's about doing something. It's about making a practice. It's about being material in the materialist world. It's about active ritual. It's a ritual of movement, at the same time, a ritual of destruction and self-destruction. And it is a ritual that is repetitive. And this repetitiveness is precisely what actually saves the image. It saves the image in the new form of immortality. It's not a promise of the immortality after the ritual is ended. It's not that many, many are saying, you do something and you get immortality and recognition by God after that. I don't think it's a case. The case is that you are involved in a repetitive process. And this repetitive process is potentially eternal. It's temporarily unlimited, at least. So at the moment, you are recorded. And you are sure that this recording will be repeated. It will be repeated through internet. It will be repeated on the TV. It will be archived. It will be seen. You will be there as a ghost, as an image from beyond the grave all over again, you have this kind of technological uh, realization, uh, exclusive but still, technological realization of the Nietzschean dream of eternal repetition of the same as the only one promise of eternity and immortality under the conditions of material world of practice which these fundamentalist uh, movements are reckoning with. So the only uh, image of immortality that we still have is a video put in a loop. Thank you. <laughs>